going to be talking about the New York scene. So for those of you interested in joining the scene or getting involved in the scene once everything opens up, the people on this webinar, um, the artists here are great, uh, great people to get to know and to get friendly with so you can ask them questions and get to, just to get, get to know what you're getting yourself into a little more. And if you're on the scene already and just coming to hang out, we're really happy to have you as well. So uh, we recently had a similar uh, hangout on uh, Tuesday where we were with our Los Angeles musicians and a lot of them were transplants from New York. And uh, so quite a few of them from that were moved from New York to LA were suggesting how wonderful uh, LA was over New York. And I thought, huh, I wonder what the New York guys will have to say about this. So I wanted to start this out with, what are your favorite things about being a musician in New York, living in New York? What's the reason you wanna be on the New York scene? I guess I'll, I can say something. Um, so yeah, I came from LA uh, for two years. And uh, the reason I wanted to come to New York was because of the diversity of the scene. Because I feel like there's any kind of musical style that you want to do is out here. And um, when I was in the LA, I was just stuck in like the jazz and salsa scene. And then when I came out here, I kind of got trapped in the Latin scene, which is great. But also like Balkan music, classical, like every everything you can think of that you want to do musically is here. And it's also easier to get around here in LA. The traffic is horrible. And like in New York, you can play like, if you're crazy, you can play two to three gigs a day. Um, and it's just more accessible here too. So diversity of music and accessibility are the reasons I enjoy New York over LA, even though the weather is nice in LA. Is the cost of living one way or the other? Have you experienced like, as a musician, that's that's for real. <laughs> yeah, that's it's more expensive to live here, uh, but it's worth it. <laughs> yeah. New York is still the <clears throat> world capital, I think, for jazz music for America's indigenous music, which is what I'm here for. Um, so I think it's the right place for me. Um, even though, uh, you know, it's such a big and diverse scene that you can, you can, uh, end up doing, you know, I've had opportunities playing Latin bands and, you know, Tito Puente and all kinds of stuff with, uh, various pop people, Elton John and James Taylor and people like that, uh, an occasional Broadway thing. So it, and, and classical orchestras too. So every. I've had a chance to do just about every imaginable kind of thing here, but uh, you know, I can't. I'm really here because of the Village Vanguard and the and the jazz scene. Scott, why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself too? I forgot to do introductions, and Jackie will come back around to you too. But Scott, tell us uh, what you do, what you play. Scott Robinson, yeah, I, I blow into the metal tubes for a living, <laughs> all kinds of tubes. I'm mostly a reed player, but I play <clears throat> some trumpet and euphonium and whatnot. So uh, I got involved with Dennis Wick through the, the Van Doren side because I was an art, a Van Doren artist for, since the 80s for reeds and mouthpieces and so on. And then uh, now it's the same distributor. So uh, I'm involved on both sides. It's kind of fun. And Jackie, you're a transplant from uh, California, you said? Well, I mean, I'm originally from Indiana, but I did school in California for a couple of years, USC, and then came out here. And, uh, you know, I'm a trumpet player, but I also play other things. I've uh, been playing electric bass a lot lately. And I play piano and guitar, but not well enough to gig on. So basically, it's just gigging on trumpet and uh, bass right now. And I guess for the past couple of years, I've just mostly been touring. Uh, before that, I was working as a full-time pharmacy tech, <laughs> as well as playing full-time and was kind of like walking around like a zombie for like seven years. And, and suddenly the music scene picked up for me. So I quit the pharmacy and started doing full-time music and everything is much better now, much more sleep. <laughs> That's kind of a real thing. Like, I think there's a huge phobia, like while, while we're in school where, you know, we want to focus on music and nothing other than focus or 
focused on music and nothing other than music. Um, and we're encouraged heavily to do that. But the reality is you probably will have to be a pharmacy tech <laughs> and gig and do it. You know, there's a good chance you got to pull on another job. And, uh, and that's just a reality. Has anybody else had to do that? Um, work the non-music job until things pick up? I worked in a music store when I first got to New York for a few years. That's where I met a, a lot of people I ended up working with. It was, it was a good gig for me. You're not the first to go from pharmacist. Pharmaceutical. I remember a pharmacist that used to play alto with Chet Baker, Jacques Peltzer, in Belgium. I stayed at his house once. I remember that. Um, why don't we continue going around with introductions um, before I forget? Uh, I think that might be the more organized way to do it. Uh, Nick, why don't we quickly jump over to you next? Um. Yeah, my name's Nick Grinder. I play um, tenor, bass, trombone, some tuba, euphonium when it's required. Um, been in New York about 10 years. Um, I'm originally from California, San Francisco Bay Area, and I went to school at uh, Cal State Northridge, um, which is in LA. So I did make the move from LA to New York. Um, I came out here just because um, I thought the music it was just more attractive to me than being in LA or in California. It just seems like sort of what everybody else said, the diversity, but also the so much really deep jazz history here, which I wanted to kind of learn about. Um, and I've, yeah, I've done, gotten to play in a lot of bands when I've been here. I've done a good amount of Broadway show work. Um, and uh, yeah, just sort of not doing much now. Um, probably trying to get ideas from everybody here on what, on how to kind of get motivation to, you know, really be creative. Um, but yeah, I'm, you know, just here trying to hang out, trying to hang on, so. Yeah, thanks. And uh, Clea, you're next. Hey everyone, my name's Clea Vanver. I think, I know most of you here, um, but I'm also originally from California, LA specifically. Um, and I know probably a lot of the, for some of the people that were on the LA call who have recently moved to LA from New York. I know Kyla made the move a couple of years ago, um, and Enrique Sanchez, great trumpet player. Um, but yeah, I've been here for about, I think, seven years. I came out here for college, um, and I've, I graduated three years ago, I think, at this point. Um, and yeah, so I play trombone, if I didn't mention that already. Um, but yeah, recently I've been doing a lot more composing, which has been really nice. I've been commissioned to do works for like, string quartet and doing something for the Wester, or I just finished something for the Westerlies right now, which is a really great um, brass quartet, if you don't know them. So um, that'll be premiering in two weeks. Um, so that's what I've been up to recently over the pandemic. And what's the verdict, uh, California or New York or the same? It's New York for me, actually, after school, I thought I was gonna move back to LA. Um, I think that was just fatigue from being in school for four years and only knowing New York as a student. Um, but after the first like year and a half or so, I settled into being you know, a freelancer in the city, and I can't really imagine going back at this point, I think. Cool. <laughs> that's a great group, the Westerlies. That's that's wonderful. You're writing a piece for them. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah there are a couple of those, um, uh, those musicians are good friends of mine. I went to Juilliard with Andy and Riley. Um, yeah, Riley is amazing. Yeah, he's the best. Yeah, he's really yeah. great. Yeah, I've, I've worked with him. Awesome. <clears throat> Thanks, Kalia. Um, Jeffrey, you're next. Hey, I'm Jeffrey. Can you hear me okay? Am I good? Great. Cool. Yeah. I'm Jeffrey Miller. Uh, I'm from New Orleans, so I'm a trombone player, singer, uh, tuba and euphonium where appropriate, just like Nick, um, composer, all that good stuff. Um, I originally moved to New York. I'm in New Orleans right now just for the holidays and my birthday, but I moved to New York six years ago for, for school at Juilliard. Um, went there with Kalia, um, and uh, I graduated. I went there for my undergrad and for grad school. <clears throat> so I just finished up in May, so I'm fresh out. It feels great. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I've been lucky to do a lot of um, a lot of stuff and touring and stuff like that with Winton and a bunch of other groups. Um, yeah, playing all around the city. Love New York. 
a lot. Thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, Kate Amron, you're up. Oh. Player, can you hear me? Just got it. Okay. Um, I play trumpet in case that wasn't said. Um, I have been in New York for 10 years. I'm originally from the Washington, D.C. area, and I came to New York for school, and I love it. I kind of echo what everyone else has said before. I came here for the diversity of music and just being able to do, you know, like three different kinds of gigs one day or a week, um, and it's it's so great. I just, yeah, I love it. Um, things I've been up to recently, I started a virtual brass workshop called Brass Out Loud for students of all ages and genders and we're just dedicated to uplifting underrepresented voices in the brass community and so that's what it has been taking up a lot of my time as well as practicing and recording and just trying to get better every day and stay positive thanks kate uh arnetta you're up all right my name is arnetta johnson um I'm, although I'm not from New York, uh, nor am I there right now, but I'm in New Jersey, I'm born and raised, you know, right next door. So, uh, you know, I've done my fair share of work in New York and I uh, went to school up in Boston. But uh, as I said, I did fair share of work. I've did, done a couple gigs with some, some of the people that are on here right now. So it's good to see you all again. Good to see everybody in high spirits. So, yeah, this is me. Oh yeah, and I play trumpet for anybody that doesn't know. So yeah. Thanks, Arnetta. I forgot to hit the space bar. All right, Kevin, you're up. A nice background. <laughs> yeah, I just found it. <laughs> Hi everybody. I'm Kevin Woods. I'm a trumpet player. I'm from Philly, so right next door to Jersey, two hours from New York, um, Dale 95. Um, I've done some gigs in New York. SOBs and just did some different gigs. Uh, also, even playing with Farnetta in, in, our, in New York, but I'm not really from New York. I'm not really on the New York scene, so I'm here to learn as well since it's not too far. Um, again, I'm a trumpet player, um, session player, uh, recording and everything like that. That's what we've been doing during this pandemic, just recording and um, been doing some gigs lately too, so that's been fun to get back on that as well. So I'm just here to learn as well. The whole space bar trick backfires on me more often than I'd like to admit. Uh, thanks for the quick intro introductions. Um, so how many of you went from being student in New York to working in New York? Just raise your hand. Almost, well, quite, a, quite a few of you. Um, so for younger musicians thinking about where they might go to school, if they want to play in New York, is, I mean, would you highly suggest that go to school in New York so you can get a jump start? Um, and your career there? Or, I mean, for those of you who didn't go to school in New York and started working there um, through whatever connections you had, um, what would your advice? So this is for all of you to discuss. So somebody take this one first. <laughs> um, I think it depends on who you know, because you can not live here and know someone and then they can like recommend you. Um, but for me, I, actually, I also went to NYU for my master's and I had friends here already in the music scene. So when I first came here, I would go to school and then I would hang out at certain music clubs till like three in the morning, just trying to like get to know some people and playing and just get my name in there. And eventually I, was, I would get called or my name would get tossed around, but you just kind of had to find out what kind of scene you want to be in and like hang out in that scene. And then eventually someone will have you sub for them or someone will be in the audience and see you there and they'll be like, I need a trumpet player. But it's all about hanging out, for, which is what my experience has been. Yeah, uh, I'll take you back on that. Um, it definitely yeah, is definitely about letting people hear you. Um, obviously, social media makes it a little easier. Um, but being in the city, uh, or at least nearby, you know, Jersey or even Philly or Boston, um, definitely helps um, so that people can actually, you know, uh, you can actually make it out there and, and, and be on the, on the scene in real time. Um, you know, access, accessibility to the, to the scene definitely helps once people can hear you. Um, 
yeah and also you know knowing people and um as 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 much as you can let people hear you you know you'll find people that want to play with you i feel like that's true nice yeah when i when i first came here i, I also went to nyu like jack said i don't think i said that um but i i took a lot of lessons with people um kind of, but, and also when i was in la i i was kind of happy that i spent some time there uh, actually kind of being in a scene that i kind of decided early-ish on that I wasn't going to maybe make a career in just because it gave me some time to practice um, and just like really practice and not worry about working or not worry about anything and just really kind of focus on you know learning how to play well because it's, it's really I mean you know brass players like we're sometimes we start from square one every day and it's good to figure out how to kind of make that happen before you feel the pressure of, of work on you um, so I came here uh, and I, I went to NYU and they gave me a pretty they gave me like a little teaching thing um, which was kind of good for helping me. But I, the first music jobs that I had, I did a lot of like marching band stuff. Um, you know, not stuff that was sort of considered like the music that I really wanted to be doing, I guess you could say. Um, but it kind of paid my rent. Um, I think I did one season, I did like 50 or something ridiculous. And my summer was totally booked like that. And I, I, Jack, I, know, I think I saw Jack in some of, I don't the know. Seen, oh man, yeah. And the, what, a, nothing against, work as a musician is great but <laughs> those are rough those are rough gigs um it kind of made me yeah it's a good experience for me but um it was hard um but i yeah i went to there was this spot called boys harbor um i, I played in a lot of salsa music too um i haven't done been haven't been in there very much but i used to go hang out at boys harbor a lot um on monday night they had a big band um led by louis bauza which was great um and yeah, I just, you know, just being at the union, taking lessons from people. I think lessons for me were a big thing because you're learning and you're also making a connection. And a lot of people, I was really uh, impressed by how much people want to share, which is a great, you kind of think New York is such a hard place, but everybody I've met has been really generous, which is very nice. It's a school here. I mean, you asked about whether you went to school in New York. I mean, I feel like I've been in school in New York since 1984. Even though I never attended school here, I, w I went to music school in Boston. But this uh, this town, it, it is a school, and I'm still in school after all these years. Arnetta, what you were going to say something? Yeah, I was going to, um, you know, piggyback pretty much off of what everyone said uh, thus far. I personally didn't go to school in New York. I almost did, but uh, I had uh a former teacher of mine actually Dwayne Eubanks was the one because I was I was considering going to new school and uh he was like New York ain't going nowhere <laughs> but he told me he said New York ain't going anywhere he said do what you think is best for you and he says when you get done We'll all be right here. So I ended up going to, to school in Boston at Berkeley and he was right when i got done it was still there um but the good thing is uh just as everyone said um and i'm pretty sure some some of us used to do uh, i would commute just from boston to new york frequently sometimes just to go to see performances or uh, to go to different jam sessions because you know with the the dope thing about new york is a uh, city that never sleeps like how jackie said jam sessions be going till like the sun come up <laughs> so um you know in college we were all like on super shed mode it would be like all right y'all we're trying to go to new york and just hit up a jam or something or just go hang out with some homies uh in the city so we would do that go back and forth and like they like everyone else said building a network that was uh the, the most crucial part of it um which is pretty much what everybody's doing in school anyway. Like for those that went to school in New York, as they said, networking, you know, helped a lot, but not going to school there as well and still networking with musicians that were in New York. Uh, Cause you know, I still know plenty of you, you all and we didn't go to school at all together. Um, but yeah, us networking is really, really what did it. And you know, those late night hangs and being in the shed and different jam sessions. So that was it for me, yeah. 
Scott, piggybacking on what you were saying about you know New York just being a school as it is, a lot of that is, I think, you're probably referring to the musicians you're playing with are teaching on a daily basis. And I think what some other people have mentioned also, like when you get there, you're just going to jam sessions. The more people, I think Jeffrey was saying, the more people who can hear you, the better. Um, this could be like when you move to New York, but let's say you're going to New York for the first time as a musician, you're trying to transplant yourself into a scene. Um, maybe a few of you, what scene are you a part of and where is, where is the jam session that you go to first? Where is the best place to start your journey from? You're asking me because I'm the old timer here. <laughs> Everybody, and, uh, and I'm going to get back to you because I want your your old timer advice because you've been there for a long haul. <laughs> yeah, I mean for anybody. I mean, because I used to do the same thing as Arnetta was saying, come down from Boston all the time, and, and and well, not all the time, but I would come down and go to jam sessions and do sit in with people or take a lesson or something. Somebody recently found a tape where I was sitting in with, with Chet Baker in 1982. They put it up on YouTube. 1982. That's a long time ago. But that's how you started out. You know, in those days, it was more clubs. It was Bradley's was open all night. It was after hours places. And so, you know, I used to drive around in my 1949 Plymouth around New York. That was an old car even back then. And, uh, hang out at these clubs, you know, and then go eat at Chinatown at, at three in the morning and then come back, and go to Bradley's. And that's the way it was in those days. And yeah, it was all night long, playing all the time, listening all the time and hanging out all the time. And it's, I think it's different than the classical world, but in the, in the jazz world, that's, that's how you learn and absorb this music. And it's still going on today you know it's we're, we're lifers out here you never graduate <laughs> and for those of you who are a little newer to the scene is that basically what you're experiencing right now also yeah like i think a, yeah oh no, you sorry. Go first. oh no please 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 go i can offer a quick non-jazz perspective um I went to a couple jam sessions growing up when I first moved here, but because I'm primarily a classical and commercial player, I did a lot of my school, you could say out of school, um, playing in community orchestras and playing duets with friends and playing brass quintets, a lot of busking, a lot of brass quintetting in the subway, outside in the park, not much different from how things are now actually. Um, but playing chamber music with friends and a lot of duets with people that I wanted to know and hadn't yet met. and so. Playing duets with someone similar to what Nick was saying about playing for someone or taking a lesson for me was such a great way to not only like show off my playing to them, but to just make music and hang, get to know somebody else and say like, hey, this is what I do. Like, tell me more about what you do. And like, maybe we could work together. Who knows? And sort of meeting people that way has been really fun. Yeah, definitely agree with that. I think uh, the cool thing about New York as well is that it, you know, it, it sort of teaches you, at least the more you're there, it teaches, it kind of teaches you to, um, well, I'll say, I'll say it, there's, a, there's definitely a lot of pressure to sort of, you know, get, get in on the scene and be one of the cats who are out here playing, right? At least on the jazz, on the jazz scene. But the cool thing about it is that it can also, on the flip side, teach you um, about yourself and what you'd rather be doing, or it help, it can help you find your calling, right? Um, you know, you can, it can teach you to sort of through, through feeling like you need to be, you know, at every jam session and, you know, at, at Smalls or at Smoke or at Dizzy's or anything like that. Um, you know, say you can, you can go to all those jam sessions, you know, every week and um, it can, that can teach you that you'd, that could potentially teach you that you are more of someone who likes, who who wants to spend the time composing and, and, and figuring out their own things before they go out, kind of like what Nick was saying. Um, it can it can teach you that you're more of a composer who wants to compose for their own group as opposed to as opposed to being in someone else's band. Or it can show it can it can basically it can teach you a lot about yourself. Um, it, it can teach you that you may, you know, want to you may be inspired to write other kinds of music, not just um, be a jazz musician, right? You may find um, through 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 the scene you may find your own love of, of singing and playing your horn because that's kind of what happened for me um and things like that so i think the cool thing about new york is that it 
it can I mean I guess it happens everywhere as well but I think especially in New York probably because I spent the most time here um, is that it can teach you a lot about what a lot about what you feel like you're called to do um, which is cool I have to piggyback off of uh, what Jeffrey said. Yeah, what he said is spot on. Um, yeah, like oh, it's the it's the exploring factor that New York gives. Um, as I said, you know, me being in South Jersey, over in Camden, right across from Philly, you know, we we also have our scene down here where we would go out to jam sessions and do what Scott said, you know, run up the street, go get some food, go right on back. And when the jam ends, go get something else to eat, then hit your friend house and then keep shedding. And again, we'll commute up to New York and just hang out for the whole night. And, uh, you know, and then uh, taking it back to what Jackie had said at the start, the diversity just over here on the East Coast in general, um, you know, you had the jazz scene, the R and B scene going on. So yeah, it's like you you have all these different places just to insert yourself, just to see what it is that you like to do. Like I, forever, I just thought I wanted to be a jazz musician, and then after going to tons and tons of jam sessions and you know studying with some renowned jazz musicians and playing gigs and just having a great time on the scene. I uh I learned playing jazz is great, it's fun, continuously learning, but it wasn't all I wanted to do. And it took me a, a few years to to learn that. Um and you know just you know the the diversity over here with the music allowed me to explore that and learn that about myself because there is a long period of time where I would tell myself, I do not want to be an artist. I literally would say that. I'd be like, I do not want to be an artist. I don't want to be an artist. But as I started playing more uh, with other people, I was like, you know what? It would be cool to play my own music, to write my own music, and to just play other genres and just see what that's, see what that's about. So, you know, going out and listening to other people's music, sometimes at one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> It, it, it'll be those random moments where it just clicks, you know, so yeah. How many, I'll, how many others of you have had that similar experience? We had a question from a uh, attendee about, you know, what's the most recent thing you've changed your mind about, whether about your playing or your equipment or whatever, but I think this kind of ties into what Arnetta is talking about, and, you know, just being um, influenced by the variety of things that you can do in New York. Has there been anything recently that you've had time to look more into now because of quarantining or something that you've recently decided, wow, no, I, I like this instead of this, or I'm gonna move in this direction? Yeah, I'll, I think if anything, this time has kind of showed me the gigs that I wanna continue um, being a part of and some of the gigs that maybe I wasn't, my heart wasn't fully in it. Um, you know, which sometimes we don't have the privilege of saying no to things. Um, but I think at the time I could have said no to some things that I, in hindsight, didn't really want to be a part of or like wasn't as passionate about, uh, maybe musically. Um, and realizing that if I am able to, I could invest that time in my own projects. Um, and so I think this time has kind of allowed me to put my time and energy into the things I've always wanted to do and to kind of reflect on the things that I maybe didn't want to do, but was just taking everything that came at me, which there are some periods where I'm like, I'm, I'm ready to hustle. I'm ready to like take anything that comes my way. But a lot of times it's like, after it all, I'm just tired and you can get kind of burnt out on doing um, all different projects that aren't your own. Um, so I'd say, that's something that I've learned uh, recently and really thought about a lot in the last year of uh, not having as many gigs. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I had a similar sort of experience with this. I, I was actually, for a long time, I was in a Hasidic wedding band. Um, and I, I don't know if you guys have heard about it. I don't know if it's known outside of New York, but they the Hasidic community has really kept on doing weddings and celebrations and stuff. And I did a few gigs and I was like, 
kind of realized like this is not something that I want to get COVID for. You know, it's like it's not it's not worth it to me <clears throat> to continue. I'm here. I'm like coughing right now. I don't have. I'm I'm from. <laughs> um, but it's you know it's not worth it to to do that. And I thought that was a good thing. I mean, I was you know doing doing gigs like that that are jobs are so they're rough on you, especially if you're sort of like a you know like creative. You care about your own projects and stuff like that. But you know we have to sometimes we have to do that stuff because it's you know you have a free night. And yeah, I could use the money, um, but it was kind of good to sort of, it felt good to say I wasn't going to do that anymore and to sort of be like, this is too much, you know, and it kind of gave me a, it, it's given me a nice perspective to just like Kalia said, just, you know, what, what I really want to do and, you know, what, how, how I want that balance to be. Um, it's also given me a lot of time. I'm like, a, I totally, I have like 150 mouthpieces and like a ton of horns and I'm like, I'm crazy about everything. And it's, I've actually settled down. Um, into some equipment that I actually like, probably because I'm not playing a bunch of different stuff. I can actually be like, okay, this sounds good in my room. I'm just gonna be playing in my room mostly. Like, um, so it's giving me a good time to settle into some some gear that is felt good on a kind of you know, certain level. So, yeah. yeah, I'll piggyback on that too. I I feel like I've never with the heritage mouthpiece. I literally jumped into it. And normally it's like, that's like an unwritten rule. Like, hey, you don't just jump into a mouthpiece. Like you have to play it. You got to dig into it. You got to make sure you do anything. And like during this quarantine, I literally just dug right into it and I did a session on it and I loved it. And I've been playing it ever since. So I think sometimes this time that we have has uh, showed that some of the rules that are written are meant to be broken. So <laughs> it's okay to I, w I wouldn't say it's okay, but if you if you have the time to actually really get into it, you can get into a new mouthpiece and not be scared of the results. Yeah, and Kevin's talking about the new Heritage trumpet mouthpiece that's coming out. I think we should be getting it pretty soon in the states. So keep an eye out. It's, it's it was specifically designed for commercial players. So all you New York, new York trumpet players should um, have a lot of fun with this mouthpiece. Is there um, a bone version? A heritage? <laughs> yes, yes, there is. <laughs> I got it. You got me there for a second. I've had a really long day. <laughs> like my sense of humor is about <laughs> ten seconds behind me right now. <laughs> um, you have one for ten sacks. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I've seen people attach mouthpieces to their saxophones, and they say yeah. you're halfway uh, there. Now just get the other half of the horn right. <laughs> yeah, Eddie Eddie Harris did that a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. Well, while we're in COVIDville, because that's kind of a, been a discussion uh, in every single call, how how is your New York scene community, your individual communities, how have you been dealing with COVID? Have you been collaborating more together? Have you been working on, um, I mean, we just talked a little bit about things we've been learning in terms of or new ideas we've had, but how's the community been handling the quarantining and still making music? Well, I've been learning video stuff, I guess a lot of us have. So I've been making videos, you know, uh, I play in the Mingus band and the Mingus, the, the people running the Mingus band are uh, really good at uh, keeping the ball rolling. They've kept this music alive for many years and they're good people. And so they've, you know, managed to find ways to employ us. They did these Mingus Mondays live for some time and then uh, <clears throat> now they're they're putting together uh, some band videos and stuff. So I've been making a lot of videos for for them and for my own Sound of the Month Club thing on my website. And uh, yeah, I did one for you and just a lot of lot of stuff. So it's I mean it's important to keep busy. If if I've always said if I'm not working for someone else, then I'm working for me. So I never have a day off. It's it's I'm either working for someone else or I'm working for me or both. So now it's just a lot more of working for me <laughs> and I'm working on my own projects and uh, you know this one man symphony thing that I've been working on for two years and it's gonna take a lot more years to finish it. Uh, it's like a hundred instruments now and I it just, I got my, I got a very full plate. So time could, stop and i'm i'm still gonna never get all my own projects done just a quick plug I, a lot of us are doing a lot more audio visual we've got another one of these webinar sessions coming up tomorrow 
um, being hosted by Quinn Carson, uh, who's one of our LA musicians, and Matt Jefferson, um, who's some of you know from Maniacal Four. Uh, he's out in Nashville uh, playing there now, but they both have done a lot of, uh, Qu Quinn does a lot of uh, audio recording and arranging for Netflix and uh, quite a few different um, <clears throat> uh, groups out there. Um, <laughs> sorry, my mind just blanked. And Matt, I actually, when he lived in Chicago, I hired him to do some video stuff for us. So they've had a lot of experience, not just in using whatever equipment you have, equipment you have to create the best video, but also, you know, how do you organize that finished product? How do you send it into your employer to make yourself look as professional as possible? So anybody who's doing a lot more of that type of work, tune in tomorrow. Um, to, and you can find out that information on our Facebook events page. You can register for a link there. But have the rest of you been doing a lot more video work, a lot more kind of self-created chamber music? Yeah, I've been uh, kind of um, trying to be more active on social media by just posting a lot of videos of me playing, just doing a lot more covers. I used to do a lot of covers um, years ago, but I kind of stopped and focused on pushing out my own stuff. Um, but I kind of got back into it just to, you know, feed the algorithm, I guess you can say. Um, and that's been really cool just because I've gotten, I'm getting a lot of practice um, with just recording myself and making, you know, making myself sound as good as I possibly can on my own, you know, learning how to mix my own trombones and, you know, just trying to get the best sound of my, out of my recording equipment that I, that I can at the moment. Um, <clears throat> and also just learning from, you know, learning from friends who are also just professional mixers and, and things like that. Um, you know, just uploading it to social media and just, you know, engaging with people who, you know, may or may not like what I have to play. Um, yeah, and that's been going pretty well. So, yeah, just learning, using this time to learn a lot. Yeah, I've been doing the same thing. I think I've uh, been playing other instruments more than I've been playing trumpet lately on uh, my Instagram videos, uh, but I'm just like experimenting with mixing also other instruments together and doing like a lot of trying to get my like home studio set up better. Uh, I think this pandemic forced a lot of people to have to buy equipment and then we're all trying to figure out how to get the best out of it. But um, yeah, been making a lot of videos for myself personally and uh, whether people like it or not, just posting online and it's just there. Um, so yeah. Lots of studio stuff. Oh, I should say that I'm also, um, when I do have to record video and audio, a lot of the, a few times, not a, half, about half of the time, it, it isn't just for me, it's for, um, I record and send a lot of stuff in for various sessions and uh, different artists and also like, I just did this, um, I had to record this trombone part for the Colbert show as well and just, you know, sending all that kind of stuff in. So that's been, that's also been where learning this kind of stuff has been helpful, right? So, because you're learning how to send in the best possible product that represents you. Um, and so you can just learn how to do it yourself as opposed to just spending money to go to a studio, you know, you can just figure it out. I forgot to mention Deep Tones. Uh, I did two videos for, for them, Deep Tones for Peace. And one of them is uh, playing, I guess, probably right now because uh, they're doing a marathon of, I don't know, like a, a hundred participants that have done this uh, and they're playing them all back to back today until, until it's over. Deep tones for peace. It's worth checking out. You know, one of the interesting things that came up in our London discussion, our London scene discussion, which was yesterday, and um, Stephen Wick, who's here, hi, Stephen, uh, reminded me of this in the in the chat box here, is um, one of the discussions we got into is how a lot of those guys were touring and, and going a bunch of different places, because uh, you're in London, you're right next door to Europe, you can, you know, go anywhere, and their, their touring opportunities had been cut, the bands that they would go out with, and so now that they were, um, Byron Wallen, who's a fantastic trumpet player out there um, was talking about how he's been throwing himself more into local projects and uh, he does a lot uh, with uh, his gamelan ensemble and um, and other community music groups have you had a chance to kind of get more in touch with 
certain community groups because you're just at home more right now or are you just doing your own thing for right now? I definitely have. Um, when everything shut down in March, I had been playing a lot of brass quintet tunes with some people in Brooklyn, and then we decided to like really form a group and start going out every weekend in the park. And so we would have our same corner of Prospect Park that we would be in at the same time every week, starting from like May through November almost. Um, and I think I only missed like two or three weeks the whole year. So that was a really great experience. We were like literally playing for the community and I had this like cardboard sign um, that like I wrote on in Sharpie or Venmo handle and people could request songs via our Instagram. And so it was a really fun thing. But we eventually had BBC come out and interview us, which was a really crazy time. Um, and it was all just from like sight reading brass quintets every week. So it was a great experience for us to be playing and, you know, like especially in May when everything was still like we had no idea what was happening and whether it was safe and to get to play with real people again. But then also, you know, we would have a crowd and so it would feel like a real performance. And so then it would we would get nervous and be like, OK, like, let's not maybe sight read that tune that like doesn't sound that great. Let's pick something that we know. Um, and so that has been a really fun thing. Of course, now with everything little too cold it hasn't we haven't been going out but I also joined a funk brass band which I play with in with Jackie as well called the New Heights Brass Band and it's all women and we were we would go out in the West Village and play for people at the bars and that was really fun for me just to get out of like the classical bubble and to work on my lead playing and improvising and that was like very up close playing for people but it was fun because you know everyone was drunk and it was like it felt like a real party um, you know, with masks and socially distanced and everything. But so that was sort of how I've been spending my time recently, which has been really great. Um, I know down here uh, in the, the Philly area, I had a few friends who went hard with the brass band, brass band vibes. Uh, they put um, their bands together and there's one group called Snack Time Philly. So they go out and, and they'll play around the city. And the cool thing about that is, um, say like a night on tonight where it's like, oh man, I would love to go play, but all the venues are closed. I'll go check the Snack Time Philly page to see if they're outside. And if I'm up to it, I could just go out and and my friend Sam, who's uh, the leader of that band, he'll, he'll let me sit in and just, playing their brass band. So it's, it's been cool, some cool creative um, opportunities to, to still play in the midst of this whole thing. So, but yeah, the, the brass band thing that's been going on around in this area has been pretty cool. You know, it just gives the, the gives us the, the freedom to still go out and just play with each other and just jam out and have a good time and to put smiles on people's faces. So that's, that's cool too. Yeah, like uh, in the summer uh, when it's warmer, there's this community jam band that I'm a part of. So there's a whole thing called Open Streets where there's restaurants that'll have their table set up in the middle of the road. And then we'll play for them like every Saturday or every Sunday. And then we'll just, people are just so happy to hear music that they'll just come, bring their kids, sit down, drink, eat. And, um, you know, it's, it's just like people really kind of miss the music. So they're really eager to hear music wherever it is. And I think in general in New York, there's just like all these street bands that keep popping up in regular places. And it's a good thing for the community because people will come out, people will tip 20, 50, $100 bills sometimes. Uh, so it's, it's when the summer comes back, it, it'll, that scene will be great to be part of again. That was something that someone pointed out in a recent conversation also that well, a lot of people have lost their jobs. I mean, this has been devastating for pretty much most of the arts industry and quite a few other industries. There's a lot of people who have kept their jobs and are still making money, but they can't go out to, you know, they can't go out for dinner. They can't go out to I mean, movies. They can't. So like being able to see and, you know, an artist play on the street, they're more than willing to tip a little bit more because, you know, that that's their form of entertainment. That's their form of going out right now. Um, I, I was thinking to ask this back before pre-COVID when we were in, in that part of the discussion, but the community band scene, is it pretty strong? I mean, how many of you are involved in community bands and how much, you know, how much of your playing goes to community band playing? 
I don't know if this is community banned in um, the sense that you're thinking of. Can you hear me, by the way? I'm doing that space bar thing. Yeah, all right. Um, but th there's before this was happening, I, like the the rehearsal scene at the union at the the local uh, 802 was always a huge thing and always kind of a good way to get involved with uh, the scene, whatever you know, because um, people are especially trombone players and I mean everybody. It always seems like it's trying to sub those out at the last minute. Um, you know, whatever it is. Um, but a lot of those bands are just like rehearsal bands and people usually really good music, usually um, people who are maybe considered, you know, like Scott said, nobody's really retired, but you know, they're maybe they want to hear some stuff read or whatever. Um, and that's the closest thing that I can, that I've been a part of uh, that has a sort of a community band vibe. I, I don't know if that's really the right way to think of it, but it's, you know, you're not, we're not, we're rehearsing not for a gig, you know, it's just rehearsing to hear music. Um, which I think is a really nice way to do stuff. Um, but yeah, that, that's the only thing. I mean, obviously we can't play inside, so that's not, it's, it's not happening for me anymore, but that's like sort of the, you know, I don't know if that answers the question, but definitely a thing that I, I used to do that I loved. I, I would give anything to go play a rehearsal at 10.30 a.m. right now, you know. The, you know. So. Um, I was going to say, am I, is my mic working? Am I good? Okay. Um, there's this, this band that I'm technically in, I just, for some reason, scheduling purposes, I haven't been able to actually make any of the gigs, but I le believe Kalia has played a, at least, a, at least one of them. Uh, there's this band that I play with, um, India Owens is a bass player in New York and she has a band called India Owens and the Cookout. And she did this, she's been doing this really amazing thing where, um, she goes, she sets up, um, she sets up the band in Harlem and she basically plays for the community and, and gives out free food for people and, and, you know, makes it a really, really beautiful, uh, event. For some reason, I just timing, timing issues have worked out to where I couldn't make any of the, of the gigs, but, um, I've seen those and, and I feel like those are really amazing, um, community initiatives that are definitely needed during this time. Um, so that's just something that came up in my head. That's really cool. Yeah, I think what's kind of cool about this whole COVID quarantine experience is it's caused people to really start collaborating in new ways and to create some new ways to play music and perform it and to take different art forms and put them together. And that haven't that not maybe not necessarily haven't been done before, but maybe haven't been done enough because we've been busy making money at the at the traditional ways of making money, just playing music. Yes. <laughs> um, so as we look into the future. Um, how, what do you think the music scene is going to look like? Do you think people will continue to, I mean, if everything open, when everything opens up, do you think people will continue to be as creative and to continue to collaborate enough? And do you feel like things are going to reopen and, and life is just going to go back to, you know, we play these clubs, we do these jams, you know, kind of do the same thing. Not that the same is bad, but, you know, how do you think things are going to look in a, in a couple of years? I hope, sorry. You can go ahead, Scott. No, I just, I just was going to say that creativity doesn't, it won't be put down by anything, by wars, by famine, by anything. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm never worried about the music. I'm just worried about the opportunities to present it. You know, that we'll have to, we'll have to see about that. But the music will be just fine. And I think some of the opportunities that we've all made for ourselves, you know, like Jackie and Kate and all of us were saying during the summer. The warmer months, uh, we all took to the outdoors and we're playing with friends and community bands outside. Um, and I think that would stick and I would like to think that it will stick because some of my favorite memories in the last year, the silver lining has been the opportunity to play almost exclusively outdoors in New York, which is not, which was not common for me, uh, you know, prior to COVID. Um, and some of these like DIY outdoor spaces, like playing in people's yards in Dimmis or playing in Prospect Park, um, you know, and playing for people that didn't know about your show, but who would just walk up with their family or their friends and just stick around for the show. Um, I really hope that maintains and I think it will. And I think, you know, this upcoming summer, we don't really know what things are going to look like, but I'm sure it'll look a lot similar, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, and so I hope if, if venues aren't able to open up, I hope that that builds more, you know, the outdoor opportunities. Um, and, would, you know, I would love to maintain that even for the years to come. 
Uh, so, yeah. I would uh, like to hope that um, people who are venues and people who, you know, I guess talent buyers and people like that, people who, you know, provide these opportunities uh, start to have more of an appreciation for what we do. Um, I That's something that I um, definitely want to see, uh, you know, come out of, you know, this time that we've been in. Because um, I think definitely people are obviously, um, you know, fiending for amazing music and amazing performances and things like that. So um, all I hope is that the people who provide these opportunities in these venues, you know, keep that, you know what I mean? And, you know, act accordingly to that. Um, I think the only good thing about this pandemic is uh, I've had the opportunity to play with people that I've never been able to play with before because they've been touring or on Broadway and they're just so busy. So um, like a lot of these community things I do that have been built by like Broadway people who don't, you know, cause obviously Broadway's closed. So they're like, we need to do something. So eventually when it comes back, it might go away, but until then um, it's, it's been great to be able to play with people that I've always seen on Instagram or Facebook and like actually get to play with them in person. And I think it will continue until things really get back to normal. Cause once the tours and everything start up again, then people might not have time to um, do all the stuff that's been happening lately. Do you see any areas of your industry that are doing a great job of uh, sustaining their art scene while while they're closed down? I, we, some of them is, um, a couple stories came up in the past uh, discussions um, where one um, set of, uh, of one group of theaters that was all owned by this one woman, she actually, even though it was at a loss to her, made it possible to create some shows where people got tested for COVID every single day, even though it was very expensive, just to make sure that people who had the jobs for stage work and for music wouldn't go off and work in a different industry because then when things opened back up, she'd have no one to be able to work her stage anymore. So she actually, you know, invested in creating some jobs. So that there's these great encouraging stories from all over the world where people, you know, the people who are hiring you are doing a good job of trying to make sure that you are there when things open up again. In New York, do you see um, some signs of that where people are really trying to save the scene so that when it reopens, it's healthy still? Well, I, I think mean, if, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Scott. I mentioned Mingus, you know, they, they're really trying to keep something going. And also Spike Wilner, who runs Smalls, you know, he's really, really fighting the good fight and trying really, really hard to, to, to keep this, this music going. But you know, we lost the jazz standard. That's this the club I played at the most. That was my big, my biggest employer in New York. It's gone, and uh, I got the very sad news today that Gino Moratti, who booked jazz at Kitano, just died. So, uh, you know, I, I it's tragic, and I I don't know what the future of that place is going to be, if any. So we're, we're, we're facing tough times here. And, uh, but this music, uh, you know, she, she's strong. She's a survivor, this music. She's, she's like a, one of those plants that you keep yanking it out and it just grows back, you know, and you can water it or you can not water her. Or you could put, you know, some, throw some old stuff on the ground to just grow out around it. And it, it's just, you can't kill this music. So again, I'm not worried about the music, but where are we gonna present it? That's the, that's the problem because these, the venues and the people are dying and it's, it's scary. Sorry, Jeffrey, you were gonna speak? No, I was talking to my dog sitting <laughs> next to me. I think, was it Kevin? Yeah, I was going to say something. Um, I think one thing that, that's really big in Philly is like church and like just playing at different churches. And um, I feel like I, I'm kind of proud of the scene of church, I guess. They've they've been the hope of people during this time, during this pandemic. And I've, I've, I'm still playing. I'm, I'm still doing stuff in church throughout the whole pandemic. And I think 
um, it's been cool to see your musicians in Philly that are usually on tour and everybody has went back home to their home church and you see them on virtual services like social distance of course like doing videos and stuff you see people that you have never haven't seen in years because they haven't had the opportunity to just go back home to church so I think church is big in Philly um, any musician in Philly knows that the the church music scene is huge so it's just great to see that um, people just haven't lost sight in that and churches are trying their best to figure out ways for us as musicians to still be able to share share love and share just good news in music form throughout this whole pandemic. Yeah, I say in terms of um, uh, one thing we all probably could take notice to is the, the transition in the with the mainstream artists uh, nowadays, how they literally had to go from giant arenas and stadiums to literally our laptop screens. Like, um, something I was saying at the top of the pandemic was, it's crazy how everybody's stage is almost the same size now. Um, so with that, uh, one thing I noticed is people realize real quick, nobody just wants to watch you with a mic. With a mic. That's not, you know, given that everything is literally, literally transitioned to visual, because, you know, the live aspect was completely wiped away. So it's almost as if most artists, they now, to me, they they have bands. I don't know if you all know this, but they, a lot of these artists came out with their performance, performances with full bands, not just, you know, drummers and a DJ. No, they have full rhythm sections now. Um, some people have horn players now. And I feel like the appreciation for an actual band of musicians playing. I feel like people have taken note to that. Like having an actual band behind you to support you is very important, not only for the music, but for the look as well. You know, so that that has been a thing. Um, and for, you know, they, they did figure out a way for it to work. Like Mary, you were saying, you have, there are some artists that have been, you know, using their money to, to keep their, their band members afloat. Um, you know, by giving them COVID tests so that they can come and perform. Cause there have been times where they'll be like, hey, are you guys available? And we'll be like, yes, but are you guys supplying a test? You know, like that is a factor. And most of them have, have been doing that and taking that step. So I, I just appreciate the amount of musicians that that I see artists are using now to perform rather than just hitting space bar, you know? So that that's a, a thing. And I really hope it stays that way, you know, when, when things start to pick up again, so. Yeah, I think the opinion from the London scene was that we are all very optimistic that people will want to get back out and listen to music and go to a concert and eat food while they're listening to live music because we've all been so deprived of it. But to you know, Scott's point, they're also very worried, how are we going to do that? And I, I think if people are willing to pay for it, someone's going to create a stage for it. Like, so I, <laughs> let's hope that the the general crowd uh, speaks up and 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 you know demands more music more live music and you know all these this past summer we've all been either at a concert or been a part of an outdoor concert i don't imagine those will go away this summer and those i'm sure will you know i i think the stages will come back i, I feel optimistic about that but it's going to be very interesting um of course i haven't been on the scene like like you guys are and especially scott has seen the history of the club scene in new york so um it must be very scary to see such a, a change going on there. So, so many familiar places leaving and, you know, what's going to replace them. Um, and I guess kind of on that note, um, we're being called to be very, very flexible. And I think it's hard to be flexible when you're afraid of doing something new. So this is leading to a question, which I'll just get to is um, in the, I'm going to unmute myself. 
All right. Uh, I was using my space bar thing and I just need my hands sometimes. Um, so as a brass player, as you've grown in the New York scene and as you see things changing, um, what do you feel like are pervasive myths in the scene and the, or as a brass player um, that are myths and that aren't true? Like, you know, you, you have to focus on doing jazz and only jazz if you're successful, but then you get to New York and you realize, you know what, there's so much going on here. I could start getting interested here or there, but do you feel like there's any myths that are holding people back and that we can't take into the new scene whenever it opens up? Yeah, I have I have one. If uh, oh Nick, if you want, go. go ahead, Jake. Okay, I was gonna say, uh, I think something that is something that comes to mind is just because someone appears to have um, something, you know, if someone appears to be um, doing their own thing or or looking or pushing out their own music, doesn't mean that they're closed off to other. Because I feel like if, if a lot of artists have, uh, or a lot of, I guess, band leaders have, um, you know, I feel like it, it's pretty common to see, uh, if you're a band leader and you see uh, some trombone players that you were going to call or some trumpet players that you were going to call, all of a sudden you see them, you know, um, working their own gigs as a leader. I feel like that a lot of the time that's misconstrued as being like, oh, I'm not available to take sideman gigs or or things like that. Um, I feel like a lot of the time that's there's a um, there's a misunderstanding there, and maybe even on the other side too, you know. But I feel like there's, you know, I just feel like that's a thing that maybe we can, you know, just assume that someone is available until they communicate that they're not. You know what I mean? Um, and that sounds like it's coming from a personal place, but I'm just literally speaking from you know other people that I've been talking to on that on that situation. Um, I just think if you want to call someone and they, even, even if they seem like they're doing their own thing or playing with their own bands, if you want to play with them, just ask them if they're available to play. You know what I mean? Don't just assume that just because they're doing their own thing that they're not available to play with you. You know what I mean? So I think that's something that could be, we could take into the new, the new scene is just, you know, just reach out to people no matter what they seem like they're doing. You know what I mean? Because if they're not available, then they'll say that, and that's what that is. So that's just my opinion. Yeah, I see that a lot with people, and it's like I think a lot of people don't understand who kind of are of that mindset is that it's really expensive to do your own thing. Like it's it, a lot of times, whenever yes. I've done my own thing, it's like you 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 know you're really you really burn the candle. And if you you know most people who come to New York love playing other people's music. Like nobody's here just like no, nah, I just want to play my own thing. Like that's such a nobody thinks that you know and um yeah i i totally think i think that's that's i i never understood that frame of mind either because a lot of people the best musicians i know do everything and they have their own projects and they're other, part of other people's projects and uh, that's a good thing um just in terms of myths uh or about the scene i i feel like people think that new york is kind of uh, a hard town like people are not very friendly and i i know i've probably been really lucky um but I, I have had the total opposite experience. Like my first week here, I was carrying my horn and I saw this trombone player, Bruce Item, in, uh, the, on the train. He's, he's like a, had a lot of shows, but also is a great jazz player. Um, he came up to me and just started talking to me. And that's just, I, I, every time I've sort of tried to reach out to somebody for a lesson or just talking to somebody in a rehearsal band, it, it's people, people are, are friendly and people want to share information here. Um, and because people are in New York because they love music, you know, nobody's, you know, people, I guess there are probably some people who come here who just want to make money or whatever else, whatever other reason you become a musician for. But, pe you know, people want to share and they want to share their love of music with you, um, probably more so that they live in New York. So I think it's good to really try to, you know, seek out those people who you admire and see, you know connect with them or whatever you know it's 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 worth it to do that um even if it's not a great experience like it it I, I probably won't be you probably will be a good experience probably won't be bad so you're right it's a giving it's a giving scene here i mean i hear this myth all the time around the world you know oh man new york everybody stabs everybody in the back and i could never do it 
And I don't know, they think there's something about, I mean, <laughs> hardly any of us are from here. We've all come here for the music, uh, but people think there's something about this town that as soon as you show up here, you just become this, ah, you know, <laughs> it's, it's just, we're just people. We're just students forever. Kate, how do you feel? Is it the same way in the classical commercial scene? Yeah, I think it is. And I was actually going to say, I think that there's room for anyone and everyone, regardless of, I mean, regardless of what style you play, but also just your level and your experience. I think that's sort of the best thing about New York, that whole myth of like, oh, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. And I feel like that's actually kind of in some ways not true because there's so many people here a lot you know there's a lot of community groups there's a lot of amateurs who are playing in an orchestra every week with people you know who are just like them there's a doctor's orchestra there's a lawyer's orchestra so there's a lot of people who are just music lovers who are showing up to the same concerts and everything that we are um, supporting the same people but who aren't necessarily professional musicians and so i feel like in some ways it's kind of the best place to do that because you have people like us who are doing music full time and people that are doing it half the time or whatever and there's a space for anyone for as much or whatever kind of music you want to play so in that sense it's it's pretty welcoming which is really cool well great um i'm not seeing any more questions coming in from the panelists or the attendees so um, I think I'm just going to give a couple extra notes here. There we go. <laughs> um, so thank you everybody for attending. Uh, I had a lot of fun learning a little more about the New York scene and meeting a couple new people here, uh, Nick and Jackie I hadn't met before. And, uh, so thank you so much, Nick and Jackie and to all of our Dennis Art Artists panelists who are here. Um, I'd like to invite all of you panelists and attendees to join the new Dennis Wick Facebook group. Team Dennis Wick, you can just search Team Dennis Wick on Facebook and uh, uh, sign up. Um, but it's a great way to continue the conversation with uh, artists here, or if you're gonna be in New York soon and you wanna meet up with one of them, you know, with a face mask <laughs> or ask them any questions, it's a great place to continue chatting. Um, also, you can download the Dennis Wick app to find out more about the artists. And uh, there's a Dennis Wick radio station with all their music um and a lot of great information there on our products and how to contact us so highly suggest you download that and then also uh dennis wick uh is being imported to uh, the united states through the company i work for danzer um it is uh convention season right now so we have a virtual booth at booth.danzer.com which you can go to and kind of get the booth experience <laughs> you can also get one of these free background downloads mine is called don't forget to mute <laughs> But you can download or Kevin's back there, the Dennis Wick logos. Um, there's some free stuff there. There's a lot of great advice. There's uh, our events page is there also, which will uh, send you to our other events happening this week and next week. Um, Jeffrey Miller is uh, going to be on a, a New Orleans scene talk next week. So visit the events page to get uh, to get some more information there. And uh, anyway, hope yeah. you all have a really great evening. Thank you, panelists, for being here with us today. Um, Jeffrey, it looks like you got some fans out there. <laughs> uh, ha, ha, shout out to Rod. Yeah. So, and uh, thank you for everybody who came. Uh, we'll hopefully see you on a uh, webinar later on this week or next week. See you later. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> see you. See you, everybody. <laughs>